Drone Talks is an online platform to spread ideas and to educate in the drone ecosystem. At Drone Talks, we discuss technology, regulatory, business, and ecosystem topics openly with industry leaders to enable and foster innovation for a better future. Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Lorenzo Murzilli. I am the founder of Murzilli Consulting and the uh, co founder of Drone Talks. And uh, today with me, I have uh, Sweden Rangelov, uh, the, the CEO of Dronamics. How are you, Sweden? Hi, Lorenzo. Great to be here. And uh, I said in the past, and I keep saying it, uh, having you know guests such as yourself, it's always very difficult to introduce you know uh, people with your background and your you know wealth of experience. So can you please introduce yourself and you know tell us your story and what brought you here? My name is Svilen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Dronamics, a company that uh, started with my brother, who's an aerospace engineer, uh, back in 2014. Um, and my background is as an, uh, I studied economics in the US, uh, then uh, worked on a variety of uh, fields like marketing and finance. And essentially when we saw the Amazon drones uh, with my brother, who's an aerospace engineer, decided to, that we will be essentially, you know, he, he can bring in the technical talent and I can bring in uh, the rest. Um, we are now a team of more than 100 people uh, and we're really excited to be part of uh, the drone ecosystem. I guess some of our viewers probably know the company. You have been, uh, I've seen in the news quite a bit these days, but you know, if you can introduce the company to those who don't know you, what is your mission? What are the ambitions and uh, you know, why Dronamics? Our mission is to enable same day shipping for everyone everywhere. Uh, we do this with drones, um, and uh, essentially we are building a. We're starting with a middle mile solution uh, for cargo, so uh, a large fixed wing uh, UAV. Um, it's we call it the Black Swan because it needs to be. Um, it needs to remind us of the very ambitious goal we've set, which is to be uh, uh, lower cost to produce and lower cost to operate than existing technology, which in general is very difficult to achieve with new technology. A single engine propeller driven aircraft, uh, we use a Rotax engine, so we use a conventional engine. Um, in the front, uh, our wingspan is 16 meters, uh, fuselage is about 8 meters. We uh, can carry 350 kilograms um, and fly with them up to 2,500 kilometers of a distance. Thanks. And you mentioned the uh, middle mile cargo delivery. And, uh, you know, can you can you expand a bit on that? I think uh, for those in the delivery world, this kind of makes sense. But for the rest of us, like, what is actually middle mile cargo delivery? And how does it fit in the overall delivery and logistics equation? Yeah, so if, um, it, <clears throat> if I were to send you uh, something, uh, let's say a computer mouse, um, we would, uh, it, you know, uh, th there would be a courier that will come knock on my door, uh, pick up the mouse, uh, put it in the back of his uh, minivan, then they'll go and um, unload that into a city sort of distribution center. From there on, it will be either on a truck or an airplane all the way over to you from Bulgaria to Switzerland. That journey between my city and your city, that's essentially the, the middle mile. Uh, because the courier, the journey from the edge of your city, the distribution center to your home uh, is last mile. And, and, and that's where most drone technology has been focusing on. Vertical takeoff um, enabled technology really focuses on the ability to land right in your front yard. We um, we're concerned rather connecting our two cities so we can trade better. Now I, I also picture better uh, your announcement back in July of uh, last year, 2021, right? You had an announcement about the partnership with the logistics giant DHL, right? Uh, exactly to do this middle mile drone delivery. And uh, I, I read, if I'm not wrong, that you had an agreement for over connecting over 40 airports in uh, 13 countries around Europe, right? So can you tell us a bit about that? Not not the secrets, but just, you know, what's that about? It seems pretty cool. Um, we don't sell the airplanes. Um, <clears throat> we we actually operate as a service. So our customers like DHL or Hellman, uh, which is another 
top 10 uh, logistics company worldwide. They, they they buy capacity on us the, the same way that they would buy it from, let's say, from Lufthansa. Um, now, the, for us, however, to, uh, it, to, to, to en- enable this to happen, uh, we have to also be um, present at all these cities and all these locations. And we start with commercial airports. So that's why it was important to uh, to establish and, and, and grow that drone port network. Uh, so those agreements w- w- with those, um, uh, it's actually, we'll be announcing several more um, soon. We're very critical to just establishing the customer's minds where we could operate um, for them. And on the back end, essentially the customer pays for a piece of cargo to be transported uh, from a, a certain route. Um, on the back end, we, we do not just the airplanes uh, development, but also uh, the operation and the operation on the ground. So we deploy uh, standardized ground control stations, you know, all the cameras, antennas, um, you need to, to be able to pilot these uh, from the ground. So, so in essence, if, if you want to uh, link your city, you need to have such an entry point in your city. Um, to our network. The good thing is, um, because the crew doesn't fly with the airplane itself, uh, this gateway is truly a gateway to all the other gateways, because um, then we can just uh, move the assets where the demand is. Fantastic. Thanks. And just a curiosity, you mentioned the, you know, you have started with uh, somehow conventional airports, like I guess, and uh, you mentioned some deploying assets and I'm just trying to figure out how do you integrate uh, with uh, what's already there, right? Are you planning on later on develop your own, let's say, drone ports or things like that? Or you're literally wanting to operate from the existing airports more in an integrated fashion, let's say, with, with manned aviation, for example? If you, if you look at the, the capacity constraints at airports, let's say in Europe, um, but it's kind of like that everywhere. They, they follow a power low curve. So... Uh, there's one uh, big airport that typically consumes, you know, a huge percent of the, the 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 movements from that city, and then everyone who's on the second tier or, or third tier, they they barely get any activity. So what it means is you have these runways which are out there, you have um, the staff which is out there, but they're barely getting any use utilization. We this we are not signing up Heathrow. We're we're going to uh, these cargo specific and uh, and actually the cargo industry um, itself has as a has figured that out and is already you know um, for example Liège Airport like Brussels is a big hub but um, but Liège grew to be uh, a cargo hub uh, precisely because there were there wasn't that much passenger traffic or uh, at all uh, and now they are the, the the main hub for Alibaba in Europe so that, those are the kind of airports. Um, uh, that we, we target and Europe alone has more than 3,000 uh, airports or airfields. Um, so so that w- even if we stuck only with existing airports, there's, uh, there's still a lot of growth remaining. But um, ultimately, it's all about where the end customers are. So typically, uh, most of these airports, I mean, the, most of these airfields are very, very long because they're built for big passenger airplanes. Um, so they tend to be uh, a little too far out. We're starting uh, with them, but ultimately at some point um, we can land only on 400 meters of runway. So we can um, we can land from a seaport, uh, at the seaport, we can land at the fulfillment center, uh, parking lot uh, and, and so on. So. Airports phase one, other locations phase two. That's how we think about it. Tell me more about the the Black Swan, the aircraft itself. I mean, I've seen the the unveiling. It was like what a month ago now, back in December, cold day. I've seen in the, in uh, in Bulgaria. It was a proper test, I guess, for for the unveiling. But um, uh, what's special about this aircraft? Like, what do you think is going to be the one that's going to allow you to fulfill this uh, this dream? Well, it, it looks very conventionally, <clears throat> but it, we put a lot of uh, work into it actually to be um, very, very optimized for that one particular job. So most airplanes 
in history, almost all airplanes in history was always designed for humans first. Um, we designed only for packages. Uh, not only that, but a lot of drones and um, other um, new vehicles, they're always designed with, well, yeah, we can do passengers, but we can do cargo, we can do surveillance, we can do all these other things. We, from the day, from day one, we said, you know what? No, we're not going to do surveillance. We're not going to do agriculture spraying. We're not going to do any of these things because you cannot, like, it's so difficult to fly. You have to uh, comply with such a strict set of constraints that the moment we start optimizing for more than one job, you kind of run away from that optimum. And um, and cargo is very merciless. Uh, it's cargo. The, the cargo customer doesn't care if you fly with a drone or a donkey or, you know, uh, uh, they, 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 all they care about is the price um, and are you going to be there on time? So that's, uh, but, but even if you're there on time, if the price is too high, they're not going to want it. So, uh, and, and you see that because aviation is still less than 1% of global trade, which means that um, 99 times out of 100, people just say, you know what? I know airplanes are great, super safe, super reliable, so on, but they're so expensive. Please don't put my package there. So that's why we needed to to make sure that every 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 thought we put in came from that cargo first mentality. Now, as a result, um, the airplane became a very uh, optimized machine. So our fuel consumption is um, is you could say negligible. Uh, we, if you see, we look a lot like a glider with an engine. Um, we leveraged a lot of uh, innovations on the materials and structure side. Uh, we're made out of carbon fiber. Um, we have some great people on our team who are, you know, world leaders in in, in that uh, field. And yeah, it's uh, I think we did a great job. So even though it looks fairly conventional, it's actually multiple times better than anything that already exists. And uh, you mentioned before you're a, you're more of an economist of, of of education. So let's talk economy of dynamics. I mean, I, I've seen the. The IPO, the initial public offering as well uh, in the news also a couple of uh, weeks ago. And uh, I read it was over oversubscribed, I think, almost by four and a half, five times. So it seems like, you know, people kind of trust and believe in your dream as well. And uh, so tell me a little bit about that. What's the structure behind that EPO? What's the thinking process and, and how do you see it moving forward? We started, my brother and I, in 2014, uh, our first, the, the first investment we received was from a local accelerator called Eleven. Um, uh, they've been a big supporter of us ever since. What we were essentially pitching is, is kind of a moonshot, kind of an outlier. So in the process, uh, and, and especially on the European uh, venture scene, um, I'm sorry you have to say that, but... <laughs> Uh, and I mean no offense, but people here, people in Europe, historically, they're afraid not to lose money, whereas people in the US are afraid not to lose the next big opportunity. So as a result, we um, we are b being out of Europe. We hit it off a lot better with angel investors, people who have been through the entrepreneurial journey, you know, not, not people who just uh, chase the next uh, software thing. Um, yeah. And... Because we saw such a such a great fit, we we then realized, um, y you know what? Uh, the, there's new EU regulations, just like for drones, also for public offerings. And what we did was we didn't uh, we didn't make our company public. We realized we can uh, we can create a new special purpose vehicle, um, and we can list it on this uh, let's call it junior market. Uh, created by the EU regulations, every country can have one, and any any company on that junior market, it's specifically for SMEs, uh, can can raise up to eight million euros. In Bulgaria, it was three million. First, what was important actually was the realization that as we make progress, um, you know, we also become out of reach for the retail, let's say, angels or investors, because <clears throat> uh, as you know. Companies remain private for a much longer time, and then all these um, uh, all these value keeps accumulating in the same kind of uh, pockets. Uh, whereas the pension funds, they don't really, they cannot <laughs> invest in companies until the very very later stage or uh, until they're public. So a lot of that value generation doesn't actually go into the for the Europe's pensioners, especially in Europe, which is a very underdeveloped market. Um, <clears throat> and 
we we realized you know what let's let's kind of crowdsource it it's it's kind of like crowdfunding this fresh entity uh has no other purpose than just to invest in our company just like any other investor so um and then but people there could trade um its, its shares every day so we ourselves remain a private company um and in fact actually we followed the the lead here of our earliest investor 11 which um originated like i said as a as a private um privately funded uh vehicle but then uh in 2020 just uh, a month like in the april 2020 they they did an ipo on the bulgarian stock exchange and we said you know what we already have investors which are publicly traded in bulgaria let's just open it up um specifically for us and it was quite a success uh there were people literally lining up around the block at these brokerage houses because you need to go there in person open an account um a lot of people we know uh we did just like a week of marketing we didn't do anything we just did one event and uh and that was it we had uh some great partners to help us like law for uh, the law firm and uh and the, the the main broker on that uh so we're quite happy uh and i think it's 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 another just like for the eu drone regulations it's another actually uh pleasant uh eu regulation because it is a path that uh, many other startups i would totally encourage and uh you know share all my learnings about but uh the eu did good there to enable such a such a structure and such a vehicle to happen so so innovative not only the design but also of the aircraft but also in the way to finance a startup i, I love that that's uh, that's good exactly it's it's about democratization look we are going to bring most value not to you know Heathrow to frankfurt i mean there's already traffic on that lane and so on but we're going to make the most difference in the underserved markets same thing on the financial market um now the interesting thing is if you buy a share of that spv today and you keep it until we become public one day then that's kind of your only way to participate in our future ipo after a few years as a retail investor which i think is quite exciting because typically people from you know eastern europe they don't get to participate in any ipo on the nasdaq or anywhere so uh, it's through democratization, and we uh, we're quite proud that we were able to to find a way to do that. And I mean, last questions, we I ask all everybody the same. Is kind of what's next on the horizon? Like you have done all of this, the IPO is now behind you. Uh, the aircraft has been unveiled. You have some partnership uh, already signed up uh, with big players here in Europe. So what, what's coming? 2022, 2023, and beyond. It's still like day one. Uh, as I'm, uh, Amazon <laughs> likes to say, uh, because uh, yeah, we work very hard, and um, n- now we have a product. Uh, we're we're going to be um, uh, doing the the flight test program. We're going to start first commercial flights this year, and then uh, we're going to scale up uh, over the next couple of years all these operations. So we we really um, feel like it's just the dawn of. Um, uh, of, of our business. Thank you very much for your time, Zvira. It was really a pleasure, and I guess it was uh, a trust, actually. It was very interesting for our viewers as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hansel. Thank you. Brought to you by Drone Talks Online, a platform designed to spread ideas and educate in the drone ecosystem. Search for dronetalks.online to hear from more of our industry leaders and to find out how you can get involved.